Well, hello, my name is Robin Gulliver, and today I'm very happy to be able to talk to you about my research field uh, and findings and characteristics and outcomes of Australian environmental advocacy. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about four aspects of this topic. Firstly, what does Australian environmental advocacy look like? What has it achieved? How is it changing? And what responses has change generating? Now, before I get into the data, it's important to identify what I mean by the terms I'm going to use throughout this presentation. Firstly, advocacy is the act of persuading or arguing in support of a specific cause, policy, idea, or set of values. I can involve and be an advocate for anything as an individual. When two or more people engage in advocacy, they may also be engaging in collective action, which is any action that aims to improve the status, power, or influence of an entire group rather than that of one or a few individuals. Now, these are important definitions because the data I'm going to show you today is all about advocacy groups who are engaging in collective action, those two crucial terms. It doesn't include groups like bush gear or coast care groups um, or wildlife rescue groups. It does include groups that many of you would have heard of already, such as Australian Conservation Foundation, Solar Citizens and Extinction Rebellion. And this latter group gives me, uh, brings me to the final definition of civil resistance. Later in the presentation, I'll be talking about how this civil resistance is taking shape in Australia uh, and the response it's generating. But for now, we can note that there's three broad types of civil resistance. Acts of commission, which is doing and creating, which involves things like die-ins or blockades and sit-ins. Uh, there's acts of omission, not doing, strikes and uh, boycotts. And acts of expression, which is your rallies and your marches. Okay, so if we're going to move to our first topic now, what does Australian environmental advocacy look like? To start, we're going to um, look at age issues and activities. To start with age and issues, we can look first to see how the environmental movement has grown. This graph shows data collected from around 500 environmental advocacy group websites uh, on their group formation days. The earliest date I found in these websites was 1883, which was a flora and fauna society in South Australia. Groups focusing on flora and fauna, national parks, and other conservation-related issues dominated up to about the 1970s. So from then, groups started forming around other issues. This is around other issues as in their primary issue that they say on their website. Um, first up, it was a sort of sustainability groups. And then from the turn of the century, and especially at around 2006, 2007, we saw a big surge of groups focusing on climate change. Now, this content analysis of these websites also identified other characteristics of these groups. Almost half of those groups work in a local area, um, and most of them focus, um, or just over half, focus on conservation issues. Um, 87 of the 50-odd, 500-odd groups focus specifically on climate change. Together, they ran 961 campaigns. They claimed 1.5 million members and 3.2 million supporters. Now, what sort of activity does, he, does this, this advocacy actually involve? Well, this group shows data acquired through a fun couple of months scraping event listings off Facebook. In total, those 497 groups had 728 Facebook pages between them, um, and on which those pages they promoted 36,541 events between 2010 and 2019. Now, using a macro, these events were coded into five types. Civil resistance, we talked about earlier, um, eco activities like tree planting days, information sharing activities with public talks and candidates forums, meetings and admins events with planning days and AGMs, and social fundraising events like music nights and trivia nights. Now taking into account that the data of course also reflects the growth of Facebook as a promotion platform, what we can see that there is that the most common event um, was actually information sharing events. Now this data is interesting for a number of reasons. First, it is tempting to focus on large-scale public actions as the defining tactic of Australian environmental advocacy. But environmental advocacy is not just protest. A case in point, the Extinction Rebellion and climate's, uh, uh, school strike climate events last year. This uh, two graphs, these two graphs show the media attention that these events generated. Um, and it shows how these events can actually come associated with advocacy. The graph on the left shows that um, around the 6th of October last year, there was virtually no coverage mentioning Extinction Rebellion or XR in the media. Two days later, on the 8th of October, in New South Wales alone, there was almost 650 separate news articles on that topic. 
uh, similarly, when we look over at school strike for climate, very low level coverage before the strike day. On the strike day, we have a massive peak, and then it slows down to very little after that. Now, the second reason why this is interesting to me is that I think it actually suggests what the larger source of power that collective action might have to affect change. I mean, this is debatable, but I think the data suggests that the consistent, widespread, and under the radar collective action, like information sharing event, may be what's driving a lot of the changes in public opinion and public values around environmental protection, which have evolved somewhat over the last few decades. Now, third, to me, it shows the power of science. The most common type of event organised by these 728 Facebook events uh, groups was that information sharing event. And when we look down further at the types, we can see some common subtypes. Film screenings was the most common information sharing event. And these, um, many of these are actually short documentaries, which the purpose of which is to disseminate scientific information in narrative form. The next uh, three most common events, public talks, information sharings and public forums, are uh, actually many of them also involve scientists and other experts sharing their knowledge. So even though it may occasionally feel like the world doesn't want to listen to science anymore, conveying scientific to the general public is a very important role that advocacy groups appear to be playing. Now we move to the second question. What has environmental, Australian environmental advocacy achieved? So how can we actually seek to answer this question? As the earlier slides show, a lot of environmental collective action involves much more than just protest, and it's very localised. So it makes it very difficult to link collective action to specific outcomes. Now, as researchers have, of course, uh, tried many different approaches to measuring outcomes, such as investigating correlations between changes in public opinion, public policy, and protest, or uh, the number of environmental groups at any one given time in a particular location. But you may recall that earlier in the presentation, uh, I mentioned that the 497 groups in my study population ran 961 campaigns between them. These campaigns, an organised course of action to achieve a goal, offer an avenue to investigate effectiveness. So these four squares on this slide give four different examples of some campaigns run by um, groups in my study population. Grandparents for Generational Equity here have a campaign, uh, they call their group a campaign, uh, to make it easy for grandparents who are worried about climate change to send two letters a fortnight. Sold of Citizens here has, a camp has many campaigns, one of which is keeping fossil fuels out of clean energy finance. This is ACF, uh, one of their campaigns at the time was to get Prime Minister to attend the Climate Summit and commit to an emissions reduction target. And then WA Conservation Council uh, this was a couple of years ago, they had four campaigns on their menu bar, different topics. From these examples, we can see three campaign characteristics which can help measure outcomes. The issue of the campaign, the target of the campaign, and the goal. The examples here on the left-hand side are some of the campaigns which are focusing on conservation-related issues. And for some of them, you can see straight away what the goal is. Uh, for others, it takes a little bit more looking like um, it's a balance, I think, between giving your campaign a good name that's memorable and actually conveying a lot of information in that campaign name. On the right hand side, we see um, some data on the analysis of those 961 campaigns. These are the most common campaigns. The top campaign topic was a development related issue, for example, um, like Tunda Harbour in Redlands. Um, and the majority of those campaigns focus on political targets, so they're either MPs or governments or local governments, something political. Um, most campaign targets in general are political entities. Around 100 of those campaigns didn't specifically state who their target was, so they didn't say in their communications material who they were aiming their target at. Um, and the most common campaign issue targeting in individuals was waste, which is kind of um, reasonable. A lot of those campaigns are asking individuals to reduce their plastic consumption or pick up three bits of rubbish a day, for example. Now, we're going to look first at the outcomes of climate change campaigns. Now, of course, it's really not important to note that we can't ascertain any degree of causation from this data. So one, the fact that there's a campaign doesn't mean it's directly linked to the outcome. But we can, of course, look at patterns. Um, the table on the right has some example campaign, the, the group, the campaign goal, the campaign target, and the outcome. The graph on the left shows the overall outcome proportion in this particular study, which is a paper. Um, the campaigns which achieve the highest proportion of either success or partial success 
were campaigns directed at businesses. Uh, so for example, here, a solar citizens campaign, uh, look at targeting the South Australian power network businesses. Um, well over half of campaigns directed at individuals like the like switch to renewable energy um, at your home um, had unknown outcomes here, 12 of them, 12 of the 17. Um, because we can't find any evidence of success and failure in that case. And that's a general problem with campaigns that target individual pro-environmental private behaviours, um, particularly given that efficacy perceptions are a well-established driver of people's intention to engage in collective action. So activists or advocates need to be able to show that their campaigns are successful to attract new supporters. Campaigns that attract, uh, that are targeted towards individuals can't show that evidence easily. Campaigns targeting politicians were also, um, surprisingly to me, quite successful, um, with eight out of the 21 campaigns achieving full or partial success. And it's important to remember that some of the goals of these campaigns are quite ambitious. So they might, um, a goal, for example, might be stop the climate crisis. So they're, they're aiming high in some cases and other goals are quite targeted. Let's now move to conservation campaigns. Okay, table on the left again is just examples of campaigns. Um, we can see that uh, some of these campaigns, like I said before, have very specific goals targeting different levels of government. So for example, um, the Environmental Farmers Network targeted the Victorian government, asking them specifically to end cattle grazing in Alpine National Parks, and that was successful. Uh, Conservation Council of WA had a campaign directed at the state government to just send a bill to the committee to consider amendments, which did not uh, happen. Um, and then up again here at the top, the Save the Bilby campaign. Again, we can see the challenge when we don't have a specific target. So I looked through all of the campaign communication materials on these campaigns to find the target. And if they I couldn't find it, it's just unknown. And that also means very hard to ascertain the outcome. Um, unless they become extinct, then we can say that it's it's a failure. Beyond that, there are no, there's no great. No. So when we look at outcomes now, these are specifically conservation camp, um, campaigns. We can see uh, as we showed up above, that development is the primary target or primary issue focused by conservation groups. Um, and actually half of these in the yellow and the gray are successful, either fully successful, partially successful. Partially successful might be when um, they don't stop a development, but they obtain a number of uh, revisions or amendments that increase the bush site uh, on the development, for example, that is partial success. Conservation campaigns related to mining have a lower success rate, but land and wetlands conservation campaigns actually have a really high success rate. On the right shows our campaign outcomes by target. Perhaps unsurprisingly, campaigns directed at the unknown target, that is where I can't ascertain who they are asking to actually do something, have really low success rates. So only a tiny bit of success there. And business uh, targets here have high success as do the political ones. So even though we can't say that campaign activities specifically cause a particular response or outcome, we can see connections. Um, and with the advent of big data acquisition, uh, software and analysis, I hope to start connecting campaigns, campaign events, responses and outcomes more closely to build some dynamic models. There's actually no real reason, apart from the sheer volume of data that you need, to not be able to progress this linear process to connect your campaigns with your outcomes. Um, but I would need a whole lot more data and a whole lot more time. So moving on now to our third question. How is Australian environmental advocacy changing? Well, you may have noticed some significant changes yourself in 2019, um, where there are an increased number of protests related to, say, vegan or animal rights, protest uh, collective action or climate collective action. And when we delve deeper into the data, we can see that there are three main ways that environmental advocacy is changing. First, if you were the one that was stuck in traffic last year or joined the climate strike, you might have wondered whether there's been an increase in climate change related protests. Specifically, the data shows that this is the case. There's a massive increase in climate change related civil resistance. And I would just like to point out that civil resistance in the past has been used a lot in forestry campaigns, and that's just ticked along. But this huge increase is in climate related issues. Um, and again, this there is a relationship here with the growth of Facebook and being able to promote your events on Facebook. So part of that pattern is related to that. The second way 
uh, when we actually look at the civil resistant tactical types, remember there were three types, the acts of commission, um, the blue, and if we look at expression and protest, that's always been a popular tactic, that's rallies and marches. Your omissions have increased because of the strike and some boycotts used by subgroups in the Stop Adani campaign. Uh, but what was interesting here is, is the acts of commission, we've had a really big increase in that one as well. Um, so these are acts of doing and creating, which can involve illegal activities like blockades and lock-ons, fit in, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. So a second change is how groups are organising. On the left, we have an, a conventional structure of groups, subgroups and campaigns. A group such as, for example, the National Parks Association might have, um, there might have a bunch of subgroups like Queensland National Parks Association and New South Wales Parks Association. Um, they may camp do campaigns together, they may do campaigns alone, or they may do no campaigns at all, or even other groups campaign. Um, and many don't do any campaign. What we're seeing now though, is what is happening on the right, which are directed network campaigns. These are where groups are engaging in a campaign together. Campaign resources are often pulled in a centralised team. Um, and this team might have paid staff that can do communications materials, they can facilitate research and they can um, do strategy for the campaign. This is then disseminated outwards to subgroups. Directed network campaigns enable the efficient use of resources, which is very important considering that the vast majority of environmental advocacy groups in Australia have no paid staff and many have no legal right to obtain or disperse any funds on behalf of the group. So the third way that environmental advocacy is changing is the growing diversity of targets. Almost half of the campaigns in my database target political entities said before, but particularly in the climate advocacy space with directed network campaigns, some larger campaigns are showing the ability to pivot to different targets as outcomes are achieved. So Stop It Only campaign is a perfect example of this. Two targets which have had consistent civil resistance target um, Activities directed towards them are Adani, there in the blue, and governments in the green, and both of those groups remain committed to the mine. Doesn't mean that that campaign has been a failure, however. If we look at 2017, we had a huge peak of 35 unique civil resistance tactics against banks, the big four banks. All big four banks have now committed to not funding the mine in some form or another. And up here in 2019, we had an even bigger peak of civil resistance directed at contractors like GHD and Downer and ACOM. All of those contractors are now committed to not funding the mine. So all these three changes over time, we can see how that plays out by looking at some data here. So these are the top 10 groups using civil resistance tactics in my database. Um, Extinction Rebellion, despite how young it is as a group, uh, has perhaps unsurprisingly got the most civil resistance tactics, almost a third of their total events. It has 77 subgroups. So there's a groups based on location, like um, in a Brisbane civil, uh, Extinction Rebellion, or there might be groups based on identity, such as Mums for, for Extinction Rebellion, something like that. AYCC, Australian Youth Climate Coalition, has 56 subgroups. Stop at Arnie at the time had 126. And as we go down the table, um, although I would just put a caveat there with School Strike for Climate, it's a slightly different sort of campaign, that's why it stays one, but it actually does have a lot of stuff going on around the country. So we go down the table for our 500 groups, um, as the number of civil resistance tactics decreases, so does the number of subgroups. Now these factors matter because along with the growth in civil resistance comes a corresponding public and political response and our organisational structures really matter here. So we're going to look at the fourth and final question now. What response is this changing environmental advocacy generating? Well, first, we could hypothesize that a whole lot more people are becoming involved in environmental advocacy. We have no way to measure that. So that remains a hypothesis. We could measure, we can measure, of course, how the state responds to this type of protest. Now, attempts to repress civil resistance have been a constant feature of state responses to direct action. Uh, rights and civil resistance began to be used in Australia with the Coulomb Caves protests and Terrania Creek, myriad anti-logging and forest protection campaigns. The state had a couple of uh, consistent responses to try and squash those protests. And one example of this is the use of government legislation powers to suppress civil resistance protests. Now, one enduring government response is to investigate groups engaging in these tactics to ascertain whether they still meet the criteria to be registered as charities, particularly charities with tax deductible status. For example, 350.org, after organising the Blake Break Free blockade, Port of Newcastle, um, went through that process 
ATEP other organisations perceive to be used uh, using illegal tactics, although there is a blurry line around the illegal and illegal and the extent to which the government uses this power to investigate charitable status. Now, removing charitable status can cause significant financial harm to NGOs engaging in environmental advocacy. Um, so one way groups can respond to this themselves is to not have any formal organisational status. As highlighted above, many director network campaigns use this structure. The flip side of having 120 subgroups with no formal organisational structure that can use these kind of tactics is that without any legal, legal recognition within Australian legislation, groups are more restricted in their ability to obtain funding um, and other resources. The one project I've been working on lately is investigating patterns and arrests and government responses, just to try to um, drill down a bit deeper into how specific details about how the state can respond to the civil resistance. Um, I've been looking at an arrest, climate change arrest. Arrests provide a useful proxy for civil resistance, which uses disruptive illegal tactics, which are generally the primary focus of repression attempts. This graph shows media uh, shows arrests reported across the media related to climate change protests. Um, the earliest I could find was May 2016 when the Stop it Only campaign hung people hung from the rafters for a protest against Westpac funding the, the bank. The numbers here refer to the responses made by a variety of governments, federal, state, and local governments. Um, I've just put a few examples because the table got a bit massive. Uh, so you can see here in Victoria. Uh, well, number one, actually, the, uh, the, uh, that was, again, New South Wales protest, but at the time, um, the federal courts had ruled that Native, uh, to change the Iliwa scheme for agreements between mining companies and Native title holders, um, and so they amended those laws at that time. In Victoria as well, the Victorian state government brought in new laws against masks that were actually really quite um, harsh and prohibitive, and a peak of climate activism here um, for number five prompted another surge of investigations into the charitable status of some of those groups linked, perhaps linked to those protests. Uh, and then here, when we've just got this huge surge of protests um, and arrests, this is a number of people arrests in, in the media reports, um, we can see a bunch of responses. One of them was uh, lock-on devices in Queensland, and Brisbane City Council tried to bar Extinction Rebellion activists from using their meeting rooms. Um, and also there was a bit of talk before the virus about outlawing boycott campaigns, which was a popular tactic in the Stop It Only campaign. So it'll be interesting to continue to track this data over 2020, um, particularly with the, the radical change again and how advocacy is taking place. Um, and also to see how the government might be changing their responses to the advocacy. So what's next? As mentioned, the data collection continues, as does environmental advocacy. For my projects, I've compiled the data into a publicly available database, which is hosted on UQ. I'm also turning it into a citizen science project in order to get other people involved in researching the groups, the campaigns, and the campaign outcomes. We're at over 1,600 groups now, and around 1,100 campaigns, which does not include historical past campaigns. And it's a bit like a tsunami. So in order to get the volume of data that we need, um, I'm hoping we can keep adding to this presentation. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, I also hope that both the diversity and the power of environmental advocacy has come through in the presentation. Whether we see it or not, it's happening everywhere, every day, even online now with the pandemic. And although it may have moved online, I think most of us will agree that this advocacy is only going to increase in the future. And it has the power to change and evolve in the in terms of the responses it generates from opponents and other third parties. And also the final point I just wanted to make sure was that um, the data shows to me that scientists play a really critical role in providing the information that advocacy groups use to pass on those messages and to back up those messages about urgent action and also to help direct targets that will be more likely to achieve the outcomes that these advocacy campaigns want to, um, want to secure for the future. So, thank you very much for listening.